Well, let's go ahead and get started here. And we have Dugan Kelly. Um, he's one of the shareholders and founders of Kelly Clark. Uh, it's a law firm that specializes in, uh, in, in, in securities laws. So he is now our new securities attorney for PassiveInvesting.com. And for those of you who are new and aren't familiar with our group, our group PassiveInvesting.com is a, is a national multifamily real estate investment firm with just over 220 million in, in assets in our portfolio, primarily focused in the Southeast and the Carolinas. I'm located right now in Columbia, South Carolina. And, uh, and so we have a special guest today that we are going to be um, having present on the 1031 exchanges. But one thing I wanted to mention before we get started is about our Multifamily Investor Nation Summit, which is coming up quickly. It's actually coming up in January 2020, January 16th, 17th, and 18th. And if you have not registered yet, I want you to go there and register for the summit. Go to mfinsummit.com and, and check out the information and, 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 the, and the materials there. Um, by the end of this week, we should have more of the content of the speakers that'll be there. We just secured some of our sponsors that are going to be sponsoring the summit this, this, this go around. So we're excited to present a lot of the material as we continue to grow the summit there. And for those of you who are on the live platform, I'm going to type into the platform here two URLs. One of them is going to be our uh, syndication group's website, PassiveInvesting.com. And then I'm also going to type in the MFINSummit.com so that you can take a look at both of those and poke around. Um, if you're interested in investing with us passively or having that conversation, you can fill out the investor form at PassiveInvesting.com and I'll jump on a call with you to see if our investments are a right fit for you. And then you can also go to the MFINSummit.com to find more details about that. So without further ado, I am going to turn this over to Dugan. And so Dugan, I'm going to have you get us started here and we'll, I'll be on the line here to answer any questions for you, for our, our listeners that are coming in with some questions and I'll be advancing the slides for you and taking, taking it away, taking it for you, um, taking control of it. So if I am not fast enough in turning the slides, just say next slide and I'll make sure <laughs> you get past the next one. Okay. All right, buddy. All right. Appreciate it. Well, hello everybody. Thank you for uh, joining me. Uh, this is an exciting topic for me. Certainly people that are in the, the business of multifamily syndication and capital raising. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of changes in the law over the <clears throat> past few years about this, but I like to think of the 1031 exchanges as a diversified channel for many of you that are in the kind of sponsoring your own deals or thinking about um, where might there be opportunities to help people uh, and to basically deploy capital that needs to be deployed through the, the use of a 1031 exchange. So without further ado, let's go to the next slide. So what is a 1031 exchange? So this is a high level, this presentation is not meant to be a, a full blown securities course or even a, a full blown 1031 exchange course, but this gives you a high level overview of what, the, what a 1031 exchange really is. So it refers, 1031 refers to the IRS tax code. It's the section of the tax code that allows property owners to sell one or more of their properties and exchange with one or more like-kind replacement properties. So this basically allows the taxpayer that is selling the property, an investment property, with little or no tax liability on any resulting gain. Uh, and this, and how does this help uh, help us that are that are in the business of both uh, syndicating in the multifamily space and if we're just passive investors? Well, this helps investors because it allows you to continue an investment without any adverse tax consequences. Next slide. So we want to say, what are the easy rules? So with 1031, many of you may have already known this or you've already seen this or actually used the 1031 process. So here are what we call the easy rules that you, that you can keep in mind. So all cash proceeds from the sale of the relinquished property uh, must be reinvested in the replacement property. In this case, we're talking about essentially multifamily uh, properties. So you may have the sale of your uh, relinquished property may be a uh, mixed use property or another rental, a single family residential uh, property. 
or a bowling alley or a warehouse or a piece of vacant land. That's fine. Those are all within what we call uh, like kind transactions. But all of the cash proceeds from the sale of that relinquished property must be reinvested in the re replacement property or we're going to have to pay tax on the difference. The purchase price, so the new property that we're going to invest in, must be at least as much as the sales price of the relinquished property. Or, guess what? We're going to have to pay the tax on the difference again. Uh, the purchaser of the replacement property, so this, this is one that's kind of interesting for many people that, that I see that are in the space. Um, the purchaser of the replacement property must be the same as the seller of the relinquished property. So what the IRS really is saying is the taxpayer who sold the, pro who sold the property and is looking to reinvest those proceeds, it must be the same taxpayer. And so uh, many of you may be husband and wife or, or a single person that have that own rental or commercial property in your own individual name, and then you want to reinvest those proceeds, but you want to own the next property or the slice of the apartment building that you're going to invest in, you want to own that through an LLC or a disregarded entity, and you don't want to own it in your own name. Well, the IRS says that's fine, as long as the taxpayer ID, so if you're owning the property currently in your own individual name, it's likely tied to your own social security number. So as long as your new entity is a disregarded entity, and that's what limited liability companies in the US are treated as disregarded entities, uh, you can create a new entity and invest, reinvest that 1031 proceeds in the apartment building and still be compliant. And then the last easy rule is for safe harbor protection, we need to use what we call a qualified intermediary. There are companies and individuals out there that actually service 1031 exchanges and they will facilitate uh, the, the transfer of the sale proceeds, the proceeds that you get from the sale of your commercial property into the next transaction so that you never actually take possession of it because the IRS doesn't want you to take possession. Funds that you take possession of, you're gonna be taxed on. So that's why we use a qualified intermediary. So this is the next, this is the next uh, kind of timeline. Uh, many people say, well, how long does the 1031 process take? Well, there are, there are, these are not suggested timelines. Unfortunately, the IRS doesn't let us pick and choose uh, on some of these issues. We actually have to follow these rigid guidelines. So this little uh, graph here at the bottom of this slide uh, presumes on day one, day one is the date that you close on the sale of the property that you are relinquishing. That's the property that is being sold. So between day one, and day 45, you have that, that opportunity to essentially um, list or identify potential re replacement properties. So you have 45 days to, to identify those replacement properties and between day 45 and day 180, we need to be closing on the replacement property. So in the, in the context of, of our apartment building, in our multifamily syndication, what we often see is, a, is, a, is a, somebody that is looking to deploy that 1031 proceeds. They need to match up their timeline with the sponsor's timeline or the syndicator's timeline so that the closing on the, the apartment building actually takes place in a compliant timeline. Because you, as you can kind of see what happens if we close outside of that timeline, then we're not going to be, we're not going to be compliant with the, uh, with the 1031 uh, uh, timeline. And as a result, we potentially could face adverse tax consequences as a result. So just easy rule, day one, you've got 45 day time limit to identify potential replacement properties. 
and within 180 days of the date on which you sold your property, you need to have reinvested through the 1031 process into that apartment building. So I have a question here I'm gonna throw at you, Dugan. And it's a question that I get you know, quite often and, and I'm not 100% myself sure how to answer this question. So let's say we, we sell a property day one, escrow closes, that's when the, the timeline starts. By day 45, let's say day 30, I've identified an investment. And what happens if on day 90, that investment falls through? Do I have an opportunity to reallocate or re-identify a property during a certain time frame? You, you don't. So what, what, it, what typically happens is the identification, there are multiple properties. You're not, you're not going to just identify one property. You can identify many different pop properties as potential replacements. And so that if any one of those, and, and Dan's hypothetical, let's say one of those properties that you thought you really liked fell through for whatever reason and the, the seller took it off the market or what was going on just it, it, it fell through and so it's no longer a viable replacement property. You want to make sure that you have already identified other replacement properties that would satisfy your 1031 process. So what you're saying though, and let me just kind of, you know, recap it just to make sure I'm understanding it for myself and hopefully it'll help other people who are watching. So if we have a, an asset, let's just, we were talking about, you know, multifamily for multifamily investor nation, if you will. And, you know, in our group, we buy a large apartments. And so if we're exiting, exiting a deal and we decide that we want to sell it and we're going to 1031 into the next, you know, property that we're going to acquire, we need to on day one have, or at least between those, in those first 45 days have identified probably, you know, six to 10 or however many different properties that we're going to be bidding on and putting LOIs on as potential part to part, to part of potential, potential properties that we're going to place the capital and hopefully on one of them, we get it awarded. That's right. You got okay. it. That's, that's what you, that's what you need to do. And so often, and Dan, you probably um, see this as much as I do. Um, people will approach you at a conference or they'll see you at a meetup or something. They'll say, Hey, I really want to own a piece of an apartment building, but we have, you know, duplexes or a couple rental properties and we'd like to 1031, but we've always been told that you, you, we really can't leverage it up into an apartment building. Um, and hopefully we're with, we're, we're saying, well, that's not true. You can, as long as you have co-owners, you know, the main sponsors of that deal are receptive to it. And they allow you to essentially list their potential acquisitions like Dan has in his funnel at any given time, many potential acquisitions. You want to be able to, as a potential 1031 investor or a 1031 co-owner of that potential property, be able to identify those properties for uh, closing on it. Just because you've identified multiple properties doesn't mean that you are obligated to invest all of your 1031 proceeds into a single property or uh, two properties or all of the properties that you've identified. It just means you have preserved your ability to uh, use one of those properties for reinvestment purposes. So this is your typical deal structure. Many of you that are either active season passive investors or uh, sponsors uh, of your own deal, you'll kind of recognize this. In this hypothetical, we have a, the, the orange block is the, the apartment building and we have um, most, you know, most structures currently in the syndication space are through a limited liability company. That limited liability company will own the apartment building and the sponsor syndicator is selling part of the apartment building off to passive investors. That is a, that triggers securities laws. And so in this case, we have a 70-30 split with the sponsors slash lead syndicators of this particular hypothetical owning 30% of the entity that will own the apartment building and passive investors owning 70%. And so this kind of gives you, this is a, a typical deal structure. And so you want to keep this in mind because your deal structure will change 
uh, in connection with the 1031 uh, uh, parties. So, you know, many, many people uh, on both on the, on the sponsor side as well as the passive investor side, they think to themselves, well, why consider a 1031 exchange in connection with um, multifamily syndication? And we know, we know the people that are in this space, we know that often the biggest challenge to syndication is the, the capital raising, is trying to find um, uh, and, uh, investors, it's trying to find investment that will that will uh, be deployed inside both the passive investors. Well, for the longest time, many people never considered the possibility of inviting uh, people with 1031 uh, proceeds to also participate. And so, as the lead sponsor of any particular multifamily syndication, you're often scrambling scrambling and trying to find um, uh, access to capital or passive investors. When we think about the massive amounts of, of capital that must de be deployed in the 1031 concept, I like to say, say that this is a, a massive uh, uh, raise accelerator. It, it, it increases your velocity to uh, capture frozen capital and it shrinks from the sponsor syndicate side, it will literally shrink uh, what you need to raise because it has the potential to um, inject uh, new money into your deal that you never theoretically thought possible. All right, so here are some important considerations, <clears throat> both from the investor standpoint, if you're a passive investor that's looking to deploy your 1030 one um, uh, capital into a into a multifamily acquisition, or from the sponsor side, and so you're going to want to you're going to want to figure out how much initially. This might sound like common sense, but many people overlook the fact. So if you're if you're sponsoring or syndicating a deal, and the minimum investment that you're asking from your passive investors on the syndication side is $75,000 to $100,000, uh, you're unlikely to want to take in somebody who says, well, I have a 1031 and I'd like to participate, but I only have like $10,000 in 1031 proceeds. The, the, the sponsor of that particular deal is probably not likely to, to say, uh, welcome, come on, <laughs> come on in. They may say this, this particular transaction may not just be suitable for your 1030 uh, proceeds because you want to set, you want to set kind of an internal limit high enough because of the challenges and the logistics and the extra work and resources that it will take in order to basically include those 1031 parties in it. And so timing, uh, aside from how much is coming in, once you kind of set that, what's the timing look like? Because remember our graph, the 180 days, we need to make sure that we're going to be able to match up the closing on the apartment building that will fit also into the timing for that 1031 process. Because the IRS's uh, rules of the 180 days is, is a rigid rule. It's not it's not bendable. We're not going to be able to go on 181 days or 185 days or 220 days. And so in, in multifamily uh, syndication and um, uh, extensions, closing extensions, or uh, something might pop up during the acquisition where a survey is delayed and closing gets delayed uh, for a couple of weeks. Well, all of those things have to be taken into consideration, particularly when you're inviting 1031 parties to participate with the acquisition of a multifamily uh, property. And then expectations. So remember, the 1031 parties are not treated as investors. Let me say that again. The 1031 parties are not treated as passive investors. They are co-owners, they may own a slice or a small sliver of the apartment building, but
but they are treated as co-owners nonetheless. And so the, there will be a, an agreement that exists between the, the syndicated uh, entity with the passive investors and the co-owners. And that agreement will govern uh, the expectations that anyone would have coming into a deal. And that is, how do I get paid? When do I get paid? What does the distribution look like? Who's gonna control the day-to-day -day management of the apartment building? And most importantly, what's the exit strategy? So what are we gonna, you know, how long theoretically as co-owners gonna own this apartment building with one another before we sell? And if your 1031 uh, party that's coming in there has told you, hey, I'm expecting to hold on to this apartment building for 20 years. Well, that <laughs> that might not match up with the expectations that you're laying out there for your passive investors in the syndication company. So you want to be aligned in uh, expectations with the 1031 parties for money, control, and the exit strategy, for sure. So a couple of things I have. One question that has come in on the chat box, and I also have a question. Uh, first, the question coming from the chat box here is, is can you add funds to the down payment of the new property on top of the 1031 exchange funds from, from, the, from the escrow of the prior property? Can you add funds to the down payment? Uh, uh, yes, you can. You can increase as long as it's, uh, it's uh, increased. It can't be decreased. So you're, the, the 1031 looks at any decrease for tax consequences, it doesn't look to towards the increase. So if you, you couldn't, is what you're basically saying is, is that if you wanted to go, say you had, you know, a million dollars to 1031 into another group, you could put in, you know, the million dollars. And then if you needed another $500,000 to come alongside it, you could. Um, is that correct? You could, yeah. But you're, um, you're, I mean, I haven't, I've never seen that scenario, but you, you, you could, you're not going to be, you're the, the 1031 protects that million dollars that goes in there. It doesn't necessarily protect the $500,000 that you presumably have already paid taxes on because that's sitting in another bank account that you're going to have to file a return on at the end of the year. So you, you can't, you, you won't be able to artificially increase the million dollars to a million five, if that's the question, but there's nothing restricting you as a, a co-owner of a, on an acquisition side to putting in more money than the, the million dollars. You just will do that outside of the 1031 process. You won't be utilizing the qualified intermediary for increasing that or for funding the earnest money deposits or doing the physical due diligence, those sorts of things, those will have to come from separate funds. So basically it's similar to the syndication route where you might have a million dollars to put into a property that's raising $10 million. You put it in 1 million and your entity alongside the other entity. Um, I know you're going to get through the structure here in a minute, which will make a little more sense for some people that are, that are listening and watching, but then uh, if there's other people that want to come on as, on a different entity uh, that own the same property or whatever, then they can come in with a different amount. It's just they don't get the same. They don't get the benefits of the 1031 that you would from the other group. They don't. Yeah. The 1031 is specific to the ta taxpayer that's coming into the process. So you, you will not be, you will not be in the same entity uh, and you will not own the same undivided ownership interest of the real property with other people. So your, your, the, the 1031 is unique to the taxpayer that comes into the process. The question that I was uh, thinking about when you were going through this particular uh, topic on the 1031 exchanges is the minimum that you're seeing that most groups usually look for before they accept 1031 funds. Right. So that's, and that's all over the map. So, um, I, I represent a number of, of states and uh, many of them have educational components to their, um, to their kind of platform and their desire to help uh, people. So they may have a lower threshold than somebody uh, else, but I've, on average, I would say 
uh, it, uh, most uh, syndicators or lead sponsors of a deal are looking for a 1031 party to come into it with several hundred thousand dollars at least in equity. So if you're, if you're thinking of coming in at something less than that, um, for the most part, and this is not, there's no hard and fast rules and the lead sponsor has the ability to, to, to change uh, what they want to do. But for the most part, uh, they're, they're setting that kind of internal limit from, yeah, we would be willing to talk to you about, you know, basically being a co-owner along with us uh, uh, with the apartment building. Good. And there's a, there's one question coming in here from Chad about examples of people already doing 1031s and things like that. Um, and I know you're going to be going through the rest of the, the structure and stuff. And so I think sure. it will answer a lot of Chad's questions. So I'll let you just keep on going through the next couple of slides and we'll go from there. Were you finished with this one, Moron? Yeah. Good. Here's the next one. Okay. So uh, how do we do this? So for the longest time, and many of you <laughs> may have even gone to conferences where, you, where you've listened to people that were claiming to be gurus in the multifamily space, and they've said, you can't do this. Like, you can't, you can't have somebody come in to, uh, uh, and own a piece of the apartment building through 1031 proceeds and also syndicate it at the same time. Well, that's not true. And how do we do this? Well, we do this through a structure that's called uh, Tenants in Common. Uh, or tick for short. So that's not the tick that buries into the top of your head or your dog. It's, it's, uh, it's a short, short version of the tenants in common. And it basically means an ownership uh, in which two or more people or entities own separate shares of the same real property. So remember, each person holds an individual undivided ownership in so when we're talking about an apartment building and you th start to think about, okay, from a hundred percent, and this is the, this is a, a different uh, structure. So remember when we, when we invite and when we have 1031 parties uh, participate with us while we're also syndicating a large portion of the equity needed in order to obtain the loan. So when we talk about syndication, we're really talking about is the pooling of other people's money in order to reach a threshold limit that we can essentially obtain the loan necessary to acquire the apartment building. So most people are raising equity and they're raising debt at the same time. So those of you that, that own your own individual residential home, you had to show up at the closing table with your down payment. So syndication is no different. It's basically not many of us individually or even a, a few of us corporately don't have the, the cash needed because the, the acquisition for apartment building is millions and millions and millions of dollars. And so what we do is we syndicate that down payment uh, and, and that's how we acquire the loan. In this case, when we invite 1031 parties to participate, they are structure changes because they are recognized as a co-owner of an undivided uh, interest in the real property. And so they don't own, as you can see in this chart, the, the blue at the top, that's our 70-30 split, right? And then we have the green boxes on the left-hand side, that those are our tenant and common interests. So this, for this example, and this is just a hypothetical example, we have two, parties that are participating in this transaction. One is Jane Doe and one is John Doe. Well, John Doe, uh, through the, the amount of proceeds that he brought into the transaction, he has an undivided interest in the apartment building of 4.56%. And Jane Doe has an undivided interest in the apartment building of 7.17%, which means that the syndication company in the orange box has an undivided interest of 88.27%. And so you can see how the more 1031 parties participate, you would have more green boxes uh, and, um, and the, the percentages would be divided uh, accordingly to, the, to 
on a pro rata basis on, on what uh, uh, money is actually brought into the deal. So the, the managers of the syndication company, in this case, we have two managers. We have Best Gals LLC and Best Guys LLC. They are the, the managers, and that's the standard kind of structure that we all know from the multifamily syndication. But we also have in the gray box on the lower left-hand side, we have asset managers uh, for the apartment building. And in this case, as in most uh, cases, it doesn't, have, it doesn't always have to be this way, but it is often there is a manager of the tick interests. And usually the manager of the tick interests is also the manager of the, of the syndicated entity. It doesn't have to be that way, but most often it is. And if you practically speaking, if you think about it, why would that be? Well, the, the syndicated entity owns 88.27% <laughs> of the apartment building versus the 1031 parties have a substantially uh, low, lower amount of ownership of the apartment building. And so it's not uncommon for uh, the, the party that has the most uh, ownership to also be able to, to identify and designate who is going to be the essentially the asset manager or the, the chief manager between the tick interests. So a couple of questions coming in here. Um, one question is, if somebody has a property as an individual into a 1031, can they join into a structure like this um, with, uh, into the LLC? I would assume yes on that. But then the next question following up with that would be, would, do you have to form a tick first if you're the only person in that 1031 in order to invest like this? And so I don't understand the, I don't understand the, the second part, but the, the, the first, the answer is yes. So uh, Jane Doe could, could uh, she owned, um, let's assume Jane Doe owned three rental properties uh, and she sold those. She put the relinquished proceeds, the sale proceeds, the, the, the profit through a qualified intermediary and Jane Doe created a new single purpose entity or a new disregarded limited liability company, Jane Doe LLC. And she owned her, her tick interest through that. That's totally compliant as long as the taxpayer is the same. So in our scenario, Jane Doe individually owned the rental properties. Jane Doe uh, sold those. Jane Doe created a new entity that she owned herself. Uh, and she is the same taxpayer because the LLC is a disregarded entity for 1031 purposes. And the second, the, the second part, Dan, read that, read that to me again. So the, I'll, I'll kind of re, re clarify that the last part. The last part really was, uh, I think you already answered it, was if let's just say there's one property and they sell that one property and it's them and it wasn't an LLC or entity. It was just, they bought the property with their individual name and then they sold that and they are, they want a 1031 that money into a syndication like this. Do they have to create an LLC or a tick structure in order to do this? Or since it's just themselves, can they just come in themselves individually? They can come in themselves individually or um, they can come in through a disregarded entity. And remember the, the, the party that is not reflected in this org structure and the party that has the most say at all times is the bank. And so the bank uh, who has, will have the loan, which will dwarf both the equity from the syndication side, as well as what is contributed from the 1031 side will often, their underwriting will often require um, you as the 1031 party to form a new entity, whether it's disregard, you know, to, to the extent that it's disregarded, they will, they will instruct you because they want to be able to control um, uh, the asset itself and, and some of the process. So some of these things will obviously, every time you're, you're, you're looking at debt uh, and you're um, negotiating with the bank, with the bank's lawyers, their underwriting will drive essentially what you will be doing on the 1031 side. 
but there's no restrictions for an individual to either participate individually as the same taxpayer or uh, through a disregarded entity. Got it. That clears it up for us. So let's go to the next slide. Got to get off my uh, drawing. I was on the drawing. <laughs> I was trying to like draw a screen at the same time. There we go. Yeah, that's all right. There we go. All right. So, what, what are some of our immediate action items? So, if we're if 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 we're looking to do this, and we're thinking, oh my gosh, this this might this the lights are starting to come on, and we're thinking to ourselves, and we've been having some traction, a hard traction. Uh, uh, building our investor base uh, for potential acquisitions or raising capital. And we've never really thought seriously about talking to people that have 1031 proceeds theoretically to uh, reinvest. Remember, unlike passive investors who are not forced to, uh, to invest in any particular deal, um, 1031 parties, if they want to take it advantage the 1031 process and the tax advantages that flow from it, they must deploy that capital within that 180 80 days. And so they have, there is significant kind of, they, they're working under a time pressure that many other passive investors uh, are not working under. So if you're a sponsor of a deal or a potential deal and somebody approaches you and you have set that kind of internal threshold limit, whatever it is, 200,000, 500,000, maybe you have a lower threshold of 100,000 for the potential 1031 party and they meet that, you want to notify your lender immediately because your lender will often have rules that you're not familiar with. So many, many banks in the space, even though you have the ability to have up to 35 co-owners participate in a tick structure, there is not a single lender that I know of currently in the space of multifamily lending that would allow you to have 35 co-owners on a deal. Many lenders will restrict you uh, to uh, five or less or eight or less, but they will have their specific rules. So you want to do step one, notify your lender. Step two, understand what your lender's requirements are because you don't want to be making representations or or uh, promises that you can't fulfill theoretically. Hello. Hey, on one second. Is that you? Is that me? <laughs> no, that's you. <laughs> that was me. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, so you no, want to? I have mine on vibrate, Dugan. <laughs> I put mine on silent. I don't know. How that even, I don't even know how that works. Well, anyways, sorry about that. Uh, you're going to want to you're going to want to notify your lender. You want to understand your lender's rules and the quality. You're going to want to speak directly with the qualified intermediary. So remember, the qualified intermediary is this vendor that the 1031 party may have uh, contacted. They may not have. So you may be having conversations with people that would like to employ the 1031 process, but they have not engaged a qualified intermediary yet. And there are certain qualified intermediaries out in the space that have never done this before in connection with the syndication side of it. So remember, many qualified intermediaries, you may actually be having to either educate or ask questions or kind of inform them because they're, you know, the, this is not the well-worn, <laughs> the well-worn path of the large portion of the property indicated and then you're also coming in as as a smaller 1031 so you want to have conversations with their qualified intermediary you're going to step four stop start working on the required diligence items so remember this your 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 co-owner the 1031 parties they're they're not investors they're not passive investors and as such they will be underwritten so and all Almost all cases, the bank that you're talking to uh, in connection with the debt side of it will require those 1031 parties to be underwritten 
And as such, those parties will be required, just like the sponsors are required, to pr provide diligence items to the bank. It may be personal financial statements. It may be other personal financial information or experience issues uh, that they'll have to provide. You're also gonna want, as the sponsor or syndicate, you're gonna wanna inform your investors or make sure that you're offering documents. So your private placement memorandums have language included in that that advise your potential investors that you will be listening and talking to potentially 1031 parties and as, as such that there may be additional co-owners of the real property because they're not a passive investor. And so depending on what your offering says and depending on what your co-ownership agreement says, it theoretically has the ability, taking in 1031 parties, theoretically has the ability to dilute your potential investor base. So you always wanna be truthful and transparent with your investors and make sure that they're up to speed, that this is not some sort of harebrained scheme, but that, they're, that they knew about it ahead of time and that you're having conversations with people, even if theoretically you don't take in 1031 money. And so you, step six is on the sponsor side, on the syndication side, you wanna make sure that your pro forma still works. So you wanna make sure that the, that the estimated uh, returns that you're projecting for potential investors still works, even if you're taking in 1031 parties and uh, 1031 uh, money in, in these, these uh, transactions. So what I see sometimes is, is this, this idea that, um, well, I thought they were gonna be treated as, a, as an investor, and, the, and, and the, the simple fact of the matter is they're not an investor, they're a co-owner. And they will participate and they will go, they, their participation in this transaction and their ownership of the apartment building will be governed by the TIC agreement or co-ownership agreement. And your lender will sign off on it uh, and it will uh, essentially have some, some key terms um, that you'll wanna know um, and that will be the next slide. Come on. There we go. <laughs> You're okay. So um, each of the co-owners must hold title of the property as a tenant in common. So if you you own real property right now or you you've participated in a, a multifamily kind of syndication, you may have even seen a deed, right? The deed is the official document that that signifies the transfer of ownership from one party to the next. Well, the co-owners are often reflected on that deed with an undivided interest in the real property of X percentage. So you may recall our prior structure where Jane Doe would have seven point something percent, her name would be on the deed or her entity, her disregarded entity would be on the deed along with John Doe or his disregarded entity and the syndicated entity. Uh, and the co-owners are not partners. So, and that's more of a, a taxation issue, but they're not treated as partners. Uh, partnership is kind of a, a, <laughs> a dirty word in the area of 1031 uh, things because of this idea that you have an individual undivided co-ownership interest in the real property. So remember we talked anecdotally that while the law may allow you 35 persons to own the apartment building as tenants in common um, and husbands and wives are generally considered one person, the uh, practically speaking, uh, there is no lender that I know of actively in the space that would allow you to have th 35 uh, co-owners. It's just too unwieldy and think about it. Most of these, the time limit on these acquisitions, I mean, Dan, you're one of your recent <laughs> acquisitions was even an accelerated time frame. So even under the under the the most kind of liberal time frames that we that we have with a 90 day stream, uh, you know, signing the, the purchase and sale agreement, due diligence for 30 days, and then potentially closing 60 days later or 30 days later, accelerated time frame. So anything short of that is going to be very, very challenging for a lender to get up to speed to underwrite everybody. 
just practically speaking, it's just probably not going to happen. And then you want your term on your co-ownership agreement to align with the operating agreement. So theoretically, you're going to have two operating agreements. There's the operating agreement that exists between the passive investors in the syndicated entity and the sponsors or managers of that entity. And then you will have an operating agreement that exists between the syndicated entity and the other co-owners. And that's, uh, you want those to match up. You don't want them to be inconsistent with one another. So you want the actual ownership interests stated and you wanna know essentially who is, who is controlling the day-to-day, um, the day-to-day operations of the, of the property. Uh, and in which case we've talked about the fact that this, the sponsors of the syndicated entity will likely be the chief co-manager of the co-owners. So remember the same thing on restricted ability to transfer, sell, or encumber, uh, meaning put debt on the property. The co-ownership agreement will specify that. If it doesn't, it needs to be in your co-ownership agreement. Dis- distributions. When, how, and in what amount, right? Everybody wants to know from not just passive investors, but also people that you're talking to that have 1031 capital to deploy. The the debts associated with the property, that's also gonna be in your co-ownership agreement. Voting rights are often uh, referenced. If they're not, they need to be in there, including the sale, transfer, or debt. So remember, what happens with the syndicated entity on a, on a sale doesn't doesn't um, impact the other co-owner's ability to 1031 again and again. So uh, if the syndicated entity, most most often uh, when when the asset sells, there's a liquidity event. The investor's capital is paid. If there's any preferred return, that's also paid as well on a liquidity event, and the balance of the profit is dispersed in the between uh, according to the the waterfall or the ownership splits in the syndicated entity with the 1031 parties what we do on the syndication side does not dictate what they have to do so they could decide to either take their gain and pay taxes on it or they could they could roll into another opportunity and 1031 um, into that opportunity so you're going to want to make sure that those voting rights, the sale, the transfer of debt issues are reflected in your co-ownership agreement. What happens if we disagree? This is really dealing with your dispute resolution mechanism. So if the co-owners can't agree on any particular issue, what are you going to do? Well, you want to make sure that your agreements dictate some provisions, whether that's mediation or arbitration, uh, a coin flip, something that will help you get past the impasse that you're dealing with with your co-owners. You don't want your agreement to just have nothing there. And then finally, and most importantly, certainly from a an investor standpoint, is what does my exit strategy look like? And so, if you're if you're in if you're uh, in one of Dan's deals, and Dan is the the chief manager of both the co-owners as well as the syndicated entity, he'll tell you, here's what I intend to do with the property and if, if, uh, and what that timeline looks like. And then theoretically what your, what your returns potentially could be on the, or your gain from the 1031 side, what that looks like. So uh, all of these points, these 12 points you want to make sure are reflected in your co-ownership agreement. So if you're one of the parties that uh, uh, is looking to into these transactions from a multifamily standpoint, you're going to want to make sure that those are in the agreement and that you're the manager, the chief manager, the co-owners kind of understands the process as well. So remember, the, big, the, the lender will enforce its rights throughout this entire process. They, they will want the managing uh, a tick person slash entity, which is often the chief or lead sponsor of the syndicated entity, uh, the manager of that entity, that will often be the manager of the tick parties as well. They'll want 
you know, the co-ownership agreement to have no conflicts with the loan docs, right? So remember the co-owners are signing on the loan. They're being underwritten for the loan. Even though it's a non-recourse loan, you will be signing those non-recourse guarantees with the bad boy or bad girl carve outs. Uh, each co-owner will likely be asked to sign those because you are recognized as a co-owner and a co-borrower. Uh, same thing with no right to partition. So if you think that if you're a 1031 party, if you think that you could, you would have the ability to immediately sell your interests in the apartment building to somebody else that you just met, you will likely be restricted by the lender in doing so because the lender is going to want the entire debt uh, satisfied likely before it allows any particular undivided interest in the real property to be sold. That is different. That is different from uh, Dan approving a, an affiliate transaction by one of the passive investors in his syndication uh, company. So, you, you know, that happens all the time in these where an investor might say, well, I just created a new LLC and I want to, put my interests, I bought, I invested into this individually, I wanna change it to my LLC, can we do that? You can, you can do that internally, but you would often be restricted from a 1031 process. So this kind of shows you the, the, the flow, this 1031 recap. I hope that this was beneficial or helpful for, for all of you. Uh, Dan, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions, or I know we're running a little bit uh, maybe late for your your timing, whatever. Yeah, whatever so we have a we do have a hard stop right here at uh, at the I guess the top or the bottom I guess it's the top of the hour at the 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, so we only have a few minutes. And I know there's been several questions that several of you have have brought into this that we have not had a chance to cover. What I'll do is I will send these questions to you, Dugan, and okay. that way you can kind of flesh them out and and, and write out the answer, I guess. And then uh, for those of you who want to reach out to Dugan. I'll put his contact information up here on the slide here in a minute. But I do want to also mention uh, uh, Kevin here. He is the one who, who did the redesign on Dugan's slides for him. And, uh, and so for those of you who are interested in having him do some slides for you, whether you're speaking at an event or he actually is the one that does our really nice professional uh, uh, offering memorandums that we send out to our investors, you can reach out to him as well. Um, uh, you can go to kineticslides.com to find his information and I will also send you uh, a copy. Well, let me ask you, let me ask first, maybe I shouldn't put you on the spot, Dugan, but I think you're okay if I send these slides out. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Anything to help. Okay, great. Well, I will make sure that every one of you who have registered for the webinar will get a copy of these slides. And that way you also get a copy of his contact information if you want to reach out to him in the future. On the screen right now is Dugan Kelly's contact information. I will also email that information to you because of course it'll be on the slide here so you can reach out to him after here. So I'll send you those quote questions, Dugan. Thank you so much for, for being here and taking the time. And thank you for all of you for, for who have been on the webinar and asked a lot of good questions. Sorry we didn't have a chance to reach all of them. There, there's one thing I do want to point out here, Dugan, which I think is really important to understand about these 1031 exchanges is the fact that a lot of times we think, you know, not we don't think, because we're doing a 506B, a lot of us, B is in Bravo offering, uh, we ha we're limited to only bringing in people into the deal that we have a prior existing relationship. And these types of entities, these 1031 exchanges, are they do not need to meet that qualification of a prior existing relationship. Is that correct? They, they don't because they're not buying a security. So they're not, they're not purchasing a, a, a portion of your syndicated company. They are they are buying from the seller of the real property. They're buying a slice of the real property directly from the seller. And because you, the syndicator, have locked up essentially the property, they're dealing with you in a co-ownership ability. So without, you know, uh, uh, take away the syndication uh, uh, aspect of it, the, the co any co-owner theoretically could have engaged directly with the seller uh, regardless of the syndication side. So you do not, you know, you're not, they're not purchasing a security. So as a result, the securities laws that restrict 
uh, your ability to uh, discuss with them do not apply to the 1031 parties. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dugan, for being here. Looking forward to having you back on a future uh, webinar as we talk about various d different various topics um, around the securities and 1031s and various things like that. Again, thank you so much. And thank you for those of you who have been on and, uh, and, and participated in the webinar today. So hope you guys have a good rest of your day. We'll be back next week for another webinar for the Multifamily Investor Nation.